KYW News Radio Original Podcasts. This is KYW News Radio In Depth. I'm Carol McKenzie. We have been pinning our hopes on ending this pandemic on vaccines, and that's understandable, but it's not the entire picture when it comes to keeping people from suffering and dying from COVID 19. Therapeutics are still an important part of this fight, and we wanted to get an idea of where we are now with treatments nearly one year out. And we wondered if treatments have gotten any better for long haulers, those who have recovered but are still battling the debilitating effects of the virus months later. One of the therapeutics being studied by the NIH is plasma gel solin, a naturally occurring anti-inflammatory protein that New Jersey biotech company BioAegis has been testing now for years. We've been following their progress during the pandemic, and we invited their chief medical officer, Dr. Mark Denubile, to join us again to talk about their progress and the progress of therapeutics in general. Dr. Denubile is also an infectious disease expert. According to the National Institutes of Health, early in the disease, the antiviral therapies and antibody-based therapies would have the greatest effect, and then later on, it would be the anti-inflammatories. And that is because early in the effect, infection, the disease is driven by the viral replication. So let's start with that, if we could, and then we'll get to the later stages, which involve inflammation. So if we could start out with the the monoclonal antibodies, can you explain to us what they are and what they do? Yeah, I I think it's a pretty straightforward concept. Uh, The body, when it's exposed to a virus or any foreign particle or microbe, uh, makes an immune response against that particle, in this case, a virus. One of the primary arms of the immune system is the so-called humoral arm. That's the B-cell arm that makes antibodies. These antibodies bind to the part of the virus that's sticking out usually and are able to neutralize it, destroy it, prevent it from doing what it wants to do. So when we speak of monoclonal antibodies as an early treatment in the setting of viral replication, what we're talking about is trying to do for the body what it can't do fast enough on its own. That is, make the antibodies so that the virus can be neutralized and not cause further infection. It's important, just as a caveat, to realize that there are monoclonal antibodies that are made against a variety of things, and not all monoclonal antibodies are directed against viruses or infection. In fact, there are some cases where there are monoclonal antibodies uh, directed against the immune system components that hurt the patient. So there are monoclonal antibodies that are often raised as a possibility to use in the later inflammatory stages. But what we mean here when we're talking about early treatment with monoclonal antibodies are antibodies that are directed almost exclusively against surface proteins on the virus, including the famous S or spike protein, and that they neutralize, destroy, otherwise inhibit the virus and prevent the progression of infection. That's why they're useful early on and maybe not so much later on. But what happens when these spike proteins change? Because that's what we're hearing, that when the virus mutates, that the shape of these proteins can change. And correct, that's why some of the vaccines are lose some of their efficacy. In fact, the one in um, South Africa really dropped, right? Because these spike proteins yeah. are changing the shape. That, that, that is correct. The, when an antibody is made, it's made against a specific protein or part of a protein, the spike protein being the most famous, though not the only protein involved. If that spike protein changes and the antibody can bind to it and neutralize it, disarm it effectively, then what happens is that the antibody loses effect. Now, so the antibody can be 
one's own natural immunity. So someone gets the old, old COVID and then eight months later, they get this new COVID where they've generated antibodies the first time against the old spike protein. But this new spike protein is so different, your own natural immunity won't work. The second thing is that if you give a vaccine, which is meant to generate antibodies in the end against the spike protein, if the vaccine codes for one spike protein, which is very different than protein that's circulating in the new screen, those antibodies won't work and therefore the vet or won't work as well. And therefore the vaccine may become much less effective. Also, and the third way that could happen is with monoclonal antibodies. If they're raised to bind to certain types of spike protein, and that spike protein is not on the virus that's getting into the patient at the time, they won't work. So monoclonal antibodies vaccine-induced antibodies, and natural immunity-related antibodies all could become less effective if the protein they're targeted against dramatically changes. And that's similar to what we see with the flu. Every year, the proteins on the flu virus gradually drift. Sometimes they actually dramatically shift to a new structure, and the old immunities is no longer effective, and we that's when flu often will go from an epidemic to a pandemic when there's a dramatic change. So this isn't a new concept. What is new is seeing that coronavirus can do this before our eyes in its first real se- winter season. Which is crazy. I mean, I heard a report, I believe it was on CBS, that there was a patient who became very sick and unfortunately eventually did die from coronavirus. But there were, I believe they tracked 20 mutations of the virus in that one patient. Yeah, there, there, it's interesting that uh, mutations can occur in bunches. And some viruses, HIV probably being a very famous example, are error prone so that when you treat them, they actually make errors, which are to survive. They keep changing the proteins that they put on the surface so the immune system doesn't recognize it. It's almost as if the virus is smarter than us, (laughs) and this is the case that could happen. Now, some of these mutations are meaningless. It depends on where the antibody is binding and whether the mutation in the protein, as we said, most of the time, this is the spike protein, significantly reduces that that binding. So there will be a lot of mutations that will be subclinical and irrelevant, but there can be one or more in a given virus that will negate anything that has any immunity that already exists. And we're now seeing some patients, I think we're seeing reports of patients who had COVID six months ago and now, unfortunately, are getting serious infection with a variant where the protein is so different that their old immunity doesn't help them. And it's as if they're getting COVID again, for the, but for the first, for the first time. time. So it's a bad situation. Yeah, there have been a handful of reports as well. Um about people who have gotten the second uh, dose of a COVID vaccine and then got an infection. Yeah, well, that that's a more complex story. Okay, you know, not the COVID vaccine, even in the trials before the variants were widespread, was not a hundred percent effective. In medicine, nothing is ever a hundred percent. So it was in like the Pfizer vaccine, ninety-five percent effective against infection. Luckily, near a hundred percent against serious infection. But some infection can happen, mm-hmm. and as things change in the The spike protein and other viral proteins, that's more likely to happen. So it it is clear that vaccination can also be outsmarted by a virus that's changing its surface proteins. And so the vaccine becomes less effective and sometimes, frankly, ineffective. I think you may know that 
there was a question about the AstraZeneca vaccine not being so effective uh, against the South African strain Mm -hmm. and whether it was appropriate to continue to use it in South Africa because it was less effective in preventing infection. That, that, That allows me, that may give me a prompt to remind people that protecting against infection is ideal, but what you really want is a vaccine that prevents you from getting seriously ill. Mm -hmm. And so even these, many of these vaccines that don't look so good, you know, are 60, 70 percent protective against infection, almost eliminate serious illness. So you get kind of a bothersome cold instead of an ICU admission. Right. So there is a, the question when we judge vaccines has to be what endpoint are we using? And I would argue serious infection is probably the most important endpoint to use, because if you get sick and you have to be kind of out of it for a week or so, that's not so bad as opposed to having a tube down your throat. Yeah, right. So let's um let's then talk about antiviral treatment. Remdesivir is the only one right now uh, that I that I see recommended uh, for patients at high risk for progression of the disease. Um, so can you, can you tell us a little bit about how remdesivir works? Yeah, well, very little, but I think okay. I can make it. Uh, you know. Uh, phrase it in a way that people can understand kind of the mechanisms. There, As you indicated earlier in the phone call, there are really two stages of infection with this virus. The first stage is driven by the virus multiplying and coming to high quantities. The second stage, which is often the most severe, more severe stage, is when the body overreacts to the virus with an immune response and the inflammatory damage inflicted by that immune response is worse than the virus itself. So for antivirals, we're generally talking that first stage, and that's why early is better. Once you're very sick in the ICU and intubated, the antivirals have a limited role. Some would say none. Mm -hmm. Now, with remdesivir, that's a drug that gets in and interrupts the viral replication in the cell. And so when viral replication, as it is early on, is the driving factor, drugs like remdesivir can stop that, limit the amount of virus that's produced, and presumably help the patient get better quicker. They aren't the patients that are, at least at that point, likely to die. So what we see with drugs like remdesivir is that the patients spend less time in the hospital. Maybe they don't get quite as sick uh, as the patients who don't get remdesivir, but life-saving reducing mortality and increasing survival is not so clearly a property of these antiviral drugs. And this is very complicated. It has to, different viruses use different mechanisms to reproduce, to get in and out of cells. And what we have basically done with antivirals is tried a lot of antivirals that were being developed for other reasons, Mm -hmm. Ebola, HIV, and so forth. And the chances that they would dramatically work with a different virus is not really very high. I say that all because there are a lot of people who don't think remdesivir does much. I think it's reasonable if a high-risk patient is getting sick enough that they need to go into the hospital that you would want to try an antiviral, probably with something else. But it sounds like it makes sense, and it might make you better a little sooner. But if you're one that's destined to get into this inflammatory cascade, this cytokine storm, it's unlikely that remdesivir is going to save many lives. And, uh, you know, there's been some conflict between various regulatory and uh, bodies and other people who make recommendations about whether remdesivir is clearly effective. I think the general thought is use it in patients who are likely to get sick, but before they get too sick to abort serious illness. And it probably has a modest effect in that setting. So I'm not downplaying it. I'm just saying it isn't a a savior. And no other antiviral has consistently shown 
as much as remdesivir. So we're in a situation where we have a modest drug at best and no nothing else that is even that good in the antiviral sphere. Now, monoclonal antibodies, as we said, are antivirals. They seem to work best even earlier. Mm -hmm. So as the patient's coming in or even before they need to come in, a high-risk patient say an 80-year-old with a variety of underlying diseases, could clearly opt to get a monoclonal antibody to stop the virus from replicating even before they're sick enough to uh, consider hospitalization. So a monoclonal antibodies very early, remdesivir early, but usually triggered by admission to the hospital. So then let's move on to the sickest patients, as you've explained this uh, to us in the past, and you've explained it, how the viral load, I don't think people, I don't think the message perhaps is getting out to the general public that the thing that kills people is not actually the virus. And you've explained it to us before how the viral load, if I have this right, really kind of, I guess, dies off or become, or dissipates. And it's the inflammation in the end stage of the disease, the people who are sickest is the inflammation, correct, that really takes over and does yeah. all the damage. Well, it is clear that the inflammatory response that the person who's infected makes to protect against the virus can get out of hand. This is not a new concept. Mm -hmm. Uh, Many diseases we've seen, the inflammatory response cause more of the damage. So early on, viral load, viral number is important because that's what triggers the whole process. And the thought is that if you could lower the viral load or get rid of the virus early, you could preempt the development of the inflammatory process. That has not been shown to be very common in the sense that people who are going to die Uh, are not saved by things like remdesivir. So what we're left with then is people who, for whatever reason, are progressing. Viral load is highest right about the time you get symptoms. And actually, uh, in a few days, it starts to drop in patients regardless of how they're doing. So what takes over in the sicker patients is the inflammation that's attacking the virus and in the, unfortunately, as part of collateral damage, is damaging the lung and other organs. And that is the kind of damage that can lead to respiratory failure, what you may hear mm-hmm. is the term ARDS, uh, need for intubation and death. That is what glucocorticoids or so-called steroids. Mm -hmm. These are not testosterone or performance-enhancing steroids. This is a different group of steroids that fights inflammation. And decadron and, and prednisone are probably the most famous. They interfere with this inflammatory response that the host is making that's damaging their own tissue. And therefore, once you're very sick, the treatment shifts somewhat away from antivirals, though many want to continue the antivirals uh, like remdesivir into that illness. But the emphasis switches to reducing, modulating, extinguishing the inflammatory response. And the best way to do that, even though it has a lot of side effects, especially if used long term, are these steroids decadron being the primary example. And that's why when patients are very sick, requiring oxygen, especially if they need invasive ventilation, they all get decadron. And in fact, decadron has been shown to improve survival. So you feel better and you get better more often with decadron. If anything come out therapeutically from the trial so far is that people who are real sick need and should get decadron. But it's also been in most of those studies that if you're not that sick and you get decadron, it may do harm Mm -hmm. because it's preventing the inflammatory and immune response from killing the virus. So the question is, when are you sick enough to need decadron. And if you use it too early, uh, you may actually prevent the immune system from 
uh, getting rid of the virus. So it's a fine guideline. I think most people would say that Decadron is indicated in patients who require oxygen. Okay. If, you're, if you don't really require supplemental oxygen, probably Decadron is not a great idea. And we just published a study in a journal called the Journal of Clinical Investigation, a, a, a sub-journal of that called journal, JCI Insight, where in our analysis of patients from Italy, we found that steroids did improve survival for the sickest, but actually the death rate was higher in patients who weren't that sick and got Decadron early. So Decadron is a double-edged sword. It's not like, why not? Everybody Mm -hmm. gets Decadron. There is a why not. It can do harm. So you don't want to use it too early, but you definitely, once you cross into that flagrant inflammatory phase, want to use Decadron. Now, whether there are other safer and better anti-inflammatories, That is a million-dollar question. As you know, that's what our product that we're working on, recombinant human gel solid, is aimed at modulating the inflammatory response. And we can get into that if you like later. There are other things that have been tried, like coltracine, which is an anti-inflammatory famous for its use in gout. There was just a paper, I think, in the last week, in the British Medical Journal, suggesting that coltracine used in these very sick patients could be life-saving. Now, it was a small study, mm-hmm. so there weren't a lot of patients, so there isn't a lot of confidence in the data, but it certainly was positive and, and suggestive that things like coltracine, could, which is an oral drug, and doesn't have the toxicities that the uh, high potency corticosteroids have, it certainly is a possibility that that will come into play in these sick patients as an alternative to Decadron. We're not quite there yet. Is it unrealistic? We're a year into this pandemic. Is it unrealistic to feel or think that we should have some treatments at this point that we at least have a better idea of of, uh, uh, treatments, you know, that have a better idea that work against COVID? Well, I would just say to you, there was a terrible flu pandemic in 1918. And we're now past 2018, a little more than 100 years. And we do have some anti-flu drugs. They're not necessarily the greatest. And if they're not started early, they don't work that well. So I would argue that If you use the lesson of influenza, the idea of getting antiviral treatments is not as easy as it first sounds. And in fact, the common cold, which is a variety of diseases, including some old coronaviruses, as as you uh, may know, there have been coronaviruses circulating as causes of flu-like illness and common colds in the United States for a long time. They're not this coronavirus. They're somewhat different, Mm -hmm. and they cause a mild illness. We don't have anything for that. So I I guess I would say I'm not surprised that we don't have an effective antiviral. I think the idea that we've kind of defined stages and we think we know at least a bit what we can do about the viral replication stage with monoclonal antibodies and remdesivir, and we know that there's a switch to turn on to a host-directed therapy that is something that quells the host immune response, which can be damaging, I think is a pretty good and pretty good advance over the course of a year. So I'm not surprised. I, I, I'm basically saying I think we've made pretty good progress mm-hmm. in a relatively short time. Yeah. When you look at the numbers, though, of people we've lost, it's stunning. And I think You know, the mask wearing, the washing hands, distancing, and just the fatigue that people are feeling about COVID-19 right now. There's this, you know, you see the, there's maybe some frustration among the general public, but also when you see the response for vaccines, you understand how, um, I don't know if desperate's the right, right word, but, you know, people are really looking to they you know they're really looking for kind of an answer to this or a solution to this or vaccines aren't a cure but you know what i mean an end to this somehow right yeah 
Well, I I understand that. Yeah. Listen, had the Eagles not been so bad, I would be lamenting the fact that we couldn't go to the <laughs> Eagles game. But thankfully, they picked the right year to be terrible. To bomb. But, okay. yeah, but I, I can understand the frustration. There's certainly a political element to it that's kind of superimposed over the the general fatigue mm-hmm. where people have made this kind of a, an issue where it doesn't have to be. I, I am personally very fatigued. My wife keeps yelling at me that I'm not careful enough, and I try to be fairly careful. But occasionally I walked into a Wawa to get a soda, and I forgot to pick my mask up, which was on my car seat. <laughs> Luckily, somebody yelled at me, and a boy, well, I, you know, I want to say, oh, I'm an infectious disease. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say, it's like, it's like being caught with your pants down. I <laughs> ran out of there embarrassed and went to a 7-Eleven. <laughs> you didn't even go back in? <laughs> no, I was a little nervous. Yeah. But, uh, but, but yeah, I felt, I felt awful about that. But the point is that even those of us who are in the medical profession and believe in the value of distancing and mask and so forth are fatigued with the distancing itself is an issue. And some of the questions I'm getting, if you have all had it, can you group together? In other words, if there, right. if you and a few other friends have had it, do you have to worry anymore? Same thing is now being said for people who are fully vaccinated, who are at least a couple weeks after their second dose. Can they now say that it's safe that they get together without worrying about masks and distancing? And the questions for that, I mean, they're real questions driven in part by the fatigue. And uh, the question, the answers are not so clear. I think we're going to be moving to say that once you've had the disease and or and or been vaccinated fully, that it's safe. But just when we were about to say that, then we started thinking, what about these variants? Right. And sometimes you can, you know, getting a virus and carrying it in your upper airway so you can spread it is somewhat different than actually having a virus in your system, your lower airway, and maybe other places that can make you sick. So the idea that certain patients who've either had COVID or have had the vaccine can still be colonized in their nose and mouth and talk to you and spread it is not an outrageous thought. And so the simple questions even are are complicated. Uh, If I could just speculate, I think that we're going to be hopefully able to say that having the vaccine or having COVID, at least for a limited amount of time, makes you unlikely to be contagious. Pfizer just reported not in a, a peer-reviewed paper, but I think it came out just yesterday that the amount of virus that could be isolated from people who were fully vaccinated, though not zero, was much less than those who were not vaccinated. So the idea that the vaccine cuts down on how much you're colonized and makes it less likely that you would transmit the infection is supported by that. But again, if you're a pessimist, you'd say, but they still have virus. Right. So how, how sure am I? And, uh, you know, it depends a little bit on how cautious you want to be. That's another recurring theme. I know I'm I'm jumping like I have ADD (laughs) and I didn't take my Adderall. But I think part of what needs to be thought of here is it isn't zero or 100 percent. There are a lot of shades of gray. It's a question of how much risk are you willing to take? Uh, I think there was one economist who who was trying to explain risk behavior and talking about seatbelts. And he said, well, seatbelts don't dramatically save lives as much as you think, because when a person puts a seatbelt on, they actually then go faster because they feel like they can live with a certain amount of risk. And now they can speed a little bit more be wearing a seatbelt. So one argues whether you, you will live up to or down to whatever risk is acceptable to you. 
it is clear that wearing masks, especially tightly fitted masks, or even now the double mask, keeping distance uh, religiously can really dramatically reduce the infection rate. And uh, the question is, you know, is six feet enough? How about four feet for 20 minutes or 20 feet for two minutes? I mean, these are all depending on your risk. There are some people who are hibernating in, in their attic and not coming out. And there are other people who go to see Tampa Bay beat the Chiefs. Yeah, it's a, It really is a, a risk. But the point is, I think people have to understand it isn't an absolute line. Yeah, there's a risk. There's a risk to certain behaviors and you have to decide what risk you're willing to tolerate. Unfortunately, it's not just you. The risk is for all the people that you're around. You know, in the HIV days, we used to say when you sleep with someone, excuse me, you sleep with everybody they slept with. You know, it's not just the the people involved. So when you decide you want to, you're going to go out without a mask or you're going to mingle in a crowd for prolonged times without distancing. It's not just you that you're putting at that risk. It's all the people that, uh, that are surrounding you. And that raised a lot of moral questions about, and ethical questions about what's your responsibility to other folks. Yeah. At any rate, the bottom line is for now, unless otherwise instructed, we should all be masking and keeping distance when possible. So let's loop back to the when we talked about the the sickest patients and the cytokine storm and the anti-inflammatories. That is where Jell Solin comes in. Um, so can you give us, this is something you've been working on for quite some time. Can you give us, and we've spoken before, so I'm asking if you, if you can give us a refresher on Jell Solin. What is it and what does it do? Well, Gelsalm was first discovered as a protein inside cells and was thought to help white cells move. We were surprised, actually, uh, way back near 1980 when it, we discovered that it was in the blood. You know, some people thought maybe it was just an artifact, but it is in the blood and it's in high quantity. And uh, research looking at wh- why it was there in what quantity and what affected it pursued over 10 to 20 years. And what we found is that when people got sick, regardless of the illness, gelsalin levels dropped, especially if the illness, whether infection or non-infection, had an inflammatory component. And it seemed to drop more in those with who were sicker. So if you got any kind of inflammation, especially if you were really sick, your gel solid levels dropped. And, it, and in fact, they dropped rather quickly so that when you, in an early study where we looked at people who came into the emergency room after major trauma at Cooper Hospital in Camden, New Jersey, we found that when they came in, they had low gel solid levels. What was interesting is that that couldn't easily be predicted by the clinical evaluation. And what happened was those who had the lowest gel solid went on over the next few days or weeks to have the worst complications and even die. So it was as if gel solid early on could predict greater bad outcomes. Whether that was just an association or whether it was cause and effect was unclear. But it, it, what was clear is that if your gel sound was very low and you came into the hospital, your chance of not doing well over the next days to weeks was quite high. We then began much later to start looking in animal models of inflammatory disease to see if given, whether giving gel sound back could prevent these serious complications. So it's a two-hit theory. Something happens to you, you get hit by a Mack truck, or you get an infection, and it starts the ball rolling, dropping the gel solid, and then that low gel solid predisposes to the second hit, which is the lung injury or the septic shock or the cytokine storm. So we thought that We have a window of therapeutic opportunity between when the gel solid drops and when these later serious and life-threatening complications occur. 
and that we could give gel solid back and prevent those complications, which we've now shown, not always, but we've done a, a huge number of different models of different inflammatory diseases, most infection, mostly infections, but not all. And by giving gel solid, even after the animal started to become sick, you could save the life of the animal, reduce the tissue injury. A lot of good things happen. Mm. So we were exploring whether we could do this in a variety of human diseases, and we're thinking about doing it in severe pneumonia. Lo and behold, COVID hit. And COVID came with its cytokine storm. And we said, wow, this is like almost made for what gel solid does. You get the COVID infection, you get sick from the virus, that triggers an immune response that can then be so severe as to kill you. We now know from papers over the last year from three different centers that you can, that gel solid levels are very low when you get hospitalized with bad COVID. Our group in Italy, the Italian patients from Northern Italy, where we got samples, the sicker patients had very low gel solid. And so the question then became whether gel solid, if it was replenished, which we knew was safe from some testing we had done in humans earlier, might abort the complications. And that's where we are right now. We've kind of moved away from pneumonia of any cause, even though our theory is it doesn't matter if your pneumonia is COVID, the flu, pneumococcus, staph aureus, it doesn't matter. It all leads to the common pathway of over overzealous inflammation. But COVID was the place to test that. There was a researcher in Spain who had shown some data with her lupus patients and the gel solid being very low when they got sick and had uh, when they went into remission, the gel solid levels came up. So when COVID hit, she called us or we called her. At any rate, we began talking and we decided to do a study in Spain, and uh, actually there are three sites in Europe now, uh, giving patients who had serious COVID infection, that is, they were sick enough to be in the hospital and have some oxygen requirement, kind of like the steroid paradigm, mm -hmm. and give them intravenous gel solid for a few days at the beginning of their illness, seeing if we could abort bad outcomes. We allow anything else to go. So whatever the doctors wanted to give, including Decadron, we didn't object to. Part of the study was to give them the best possible care and either a placebo, which was just salt water, or gel solid. Now we're blinded, uh, which means we're not told who gets what, and we don't know the results. The study is near completion, but not yet probably be completed this month or next. And so and then we have to follow the patients for several months after that before we unblind. But we're hoping, let's say May or so, that we we will know whether gel solid made a difference in keeping people alive and in keeping um, patients' lungs functioning better than they would have without gel solid. So that's our hope and that's where we stand. So can so the FDA has granted emergency use authorization uh, to uh, a, a number of monoclonal antibodies, um, which are also laboratory-made proteins. And I'm wondering, can we make a connection between those monoclonal antibodies and gel solid in that the antibody treatments have gotten FDA emergency use authorization. So why not gel solid? I think it shows that they're open to the idea. And yes, I do think that it's a positive step. There are a lot of regulatory hurdles to pass through. Some of them are very technical because when our company was formed, we upgraded the manufacture of gel solid. So the FDA, unlike the European agencies, the FDA decided that it was a new drug now and all the animal safety data had to be repeated. And we're a small, poor company. So that's slowing our negotiations down with the FDA. But we're in the process of filing an IND in this country. The European and Asian and Australian agencies have in general been 
more understanding that the product we have with our manufacturing process is identical to what other companies tried to do before us and uh, have therefore not forced us to do all the animal safety data again. That's why our studies have been done in Australia, in the Republic of Georgia, presently in Spain and Romania. But we're hoping soon with the data from Europe, the safety data from Australia and Georgia, and the new animal data that we're just finishing up to be able to get an an approval in the United States to do investigational trials. And uh, we'll take it from there. There is some, you know, as a doctor, of course, I hope that the vaccines are so effective that COVID becomes a non-issue, but we're not COVID specific. We're the idea that bad pneumonia, bad intra-abdominal infection, bad lupus, bad trauma are all inflammatory diseases where gelsalin can make a difference is what drives us. COVID is a unique and kind of enticing opportunity to show that quickly, but we're, we're not a specific antiviral. We're not an anti-COVID drug. We're an anti-excessive inflammation. And I think the FDA is more and more understanding that, but the monoclonal antibodies, which you point out, are really antivirals. That's something that that the FDA is used to thinking about as opposed to drugs which affect the immune response later on. So though we have some precedent that what we're doing is okay with natural proteins, it's really gelsalin works at a different site and that adds a little more difficulty to convincing the FDA that it's safe. And by the way, the idea that the FDA wants everything to be safe before they go any further, before they really want to get into how well it works, they want to make sure to do no harm, I think is to be laudable. So though we're being slowed down by it, the fact that they're conscientiously trying to protect uh, Americans from any toxicity uh, to me is, uh, is something to be emulated other places in the world. But nevertheless, we think we've accumulated enough safety data in humans, in Europe, and elsewhere, and now in the animal models that hopefully will be very positive, and the FDA will be ready to move forward with us, uh, hopefully during this calendar year. I, I, yeah. That, I mean, I think um, I understand what you're saying, of course, about the process and safety and do no harm, but at this point... Is there a little frustration here? I know um, your CEO, Dr. Susan Levinson, has written an article kind of, you know, pushing. She says, you know, novel anti-inflammatory treatments can close the gap in this disease and that the vaccines alone are not the answer. They're just a small part of the solution. Um, and, you know, she her, her article basically argues for the use of gelsalin um, because it does step in and and uh, at the at the end stage when it's the inf- in inflammation the, the the very thing that kills people that it can help and so I am just wondering, you know, about the sense of frustration there 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 might be among you and your colleagues in trying to get this out there because you believe it can help. Yeah, yeah, I I think there are, you know obviously we're true believers. That is both good but also dangerous, right? We are we have come to the the sense that this is a drug that will work and will help. Uh, I think everybody who makes a discovery like this has that kind of belief. So it's we, we're we're very frustrated with the fact, for example, that all the data from the previous runs of a. a of other companies that kind of started to develop gelsalin and then for various financial re- uh, reasons crashed and never got it, uh, we're able to sh- show that those companies, which included some big companies like Biogen, who was trying to develop aerosolized gelsalin for use in cystic fibrosis and maybe asthma, that all their safety data is applicable to our 
process of manufacturing process because our drug is by every means possible identical to what they produced. It's identical to the naturally occurring protein. So it is frustrating to hear that we need to repeat all that in a company without a lot of people, a lot of, uh, and a lot of resources. We don't have huge pockets like Merck or Lilly. And so the idea that they could not say that something that seems identical and occurs naturally anyway was okay to go forward with was a bit frustrating. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm on the side that's, you know, already a believer. And I, I, I don't want to lose sight that that comes with a conscious or an unconscious bias. And the idea that uh, safety as to most, most some people don't even want to take the vaccine. It's because, you know, some, I, I read something that I thought was funny. Somebody posted something about you don't want to take the vaccine because you're not sure what's in it, but you've been eating McNuggets for 30 <laughs> years. Uh, you know, but that's the way people think. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I understand safety. So I'm, I, I'm frustrated but I'm not angry. Okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on um, was long hauler syndrome, um, because you also feel that Jell Solin could kind of help with this. Uh, do we know? I mean, there are myriad symptoms of this. People with all of these, you know, something from migraines to neurological disorders. To, to I mean, it runs the gamut. So, yep. what have we learned about? the long hauler syndrome and um, I guess what, what have we learned? I, obviously COVID's behind it, but, but what else is behind it? Because not everybody, not everybody has it. In fact, some people with just a mild case of COVID end up with, with symptoms and issues months and months out. So have we learned anything yeah. more about that? Yeah, I, I think we learned that we should use history at least as a starting point, these post-infectious and sometimes they may be post-inflammatory syndromes that are hard to define, but include fatigue and brain fog and aches and pains in the joints and muscles have been described after a variety of things. There was the big story, I guess, back in the 70s, Lake Tahoe in Nevada, where it looked like they had a flu outbreak, and then a bunch of the people that were there were unbelievably fatigued for a long time after. There's the post Lyme syndrome. You know, arguing that post Lyme is not an infection when in post Lyme, I think, is not the same as saying post Lyme syndrome doesn't exist. I think there is a post Lyme syndrome of this fatigue and inability to think clearly and aches and pains. It's just not active infection. We've seen this with chronic mononucleosis, yuppie flu, chronic fatigue syndrome. All these already descri- described areas resemble the post COVID syndrome. So I think there's a general principle here that after you get an inflammatory insult or at least an infectious insult, that some people don't bounce back. And some of the people who go on to have the long hauling hauler syndrome have relatively mild disease. I don't think it's ongoing infection, but I think it's very possible that it's ongoing or dysregulated immune responses, that these people have continued immune activation that's able to make them feel awful, uh, but not related to an active infection. It's like the immune system should recognize that its job, it's done and shut off, but it doesn't. Hmm. Insofar as gel solid is a regulator of that, it's very conceivable that gel solid plays a role in what we would call the pathophysiology, that is the cause of this syndrome, and we are indeed very interested in whether low gel sound levels at some time in the course of the disease, particularly drawing the continuation of the of the 
post-infectious disease, not the acute infection, but the later situation is is a problem. And we would we are we just started to think. I mean, everybody was, you know, wrapped up in the acute syndrome because it's so much of a problem and people are dying. But now that we're getting past that and people who should otherwise be back to form are still suffering, the idea that some ongoing process, post-infectious, not active infectious, uh, is going on. And we would be, we're interested in looking at gel solid levels in those people and even eventually maybe doing a trial to see if gel solid supplementation can turn off the, uh, these symptoms. It's important, though, to differentiate between the various things that happen post-COVID. Some people get COVID, get scarring in the lungs, and they, have, they become respiratory cripples or at least limited by their lung disease. That's very different than the people who have this nonspecific, hard-to-document group of symptoms like brain fog mm-hmm. and aches in the joints where the what we call arthralgias the joints hurt but they're not actively inflamed which would be arthritis it's a very hard syndrome that syndrome that i think people really mean when they talk about long haul haulers not the residual of bad uh, acute disease but this long persisting ongoing group of complaints that's hard to objectify, I think is something that very well may turn out to be a immunologic disorder triggered by the infection that will require not anti-infectives, but immune modulators. And so that's where our, what we're thinking, and gelsalin, at least theoretically, is uh, in the possible therapeutic agents of being a, a regulator of uh, innate immunity. Dr. Nubali, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's helpful to hear you explain the treatments, what's happening, and where we are right now with this disease. Well, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Carol. And I think we've come a long way since we last talked, but we've still got a, a pretty good way to go. So uh, let's stay in touch. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Soon after we recorded this interview, BioEgis was recognized for its achievements and innovations by its industry peers with Best COVID-19 Response from the Clinical Trials Arena Excellence Awards. That's it for this episode of KYW News Radio In-Depth. You can listen and subscribe to the podcast on the Radio.com app or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. I'm Carol McKenzie, and we'll have another episode out soon.